as we tarry there, none other has ever known. There's a church in the Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and holds me at my Father's throne. Make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of i 
exchange it someday for a crown on that old rugged cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary so I'll cherish the Exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross. I will ever be true, each shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me some. To my home far away Where his glory forever I'll share So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will climb Change it someday for a crown. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did thy grace appear the snares I have already come tis grace have brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home when been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing our God's praise than when we me
I am the resurrection and I am the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life even though they die. And everyone who has life and has committed themselves to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a, not a stranger. For none of us has life in ourselves and none of us becomes their own master when they die. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our sister in Christ, Millie. We thank you for giving her to us, her friends and family, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I just wanted to say a couple things as we get started this morning. Um, first of all, the family has asked me to say something to the Facebook friends that are out there, which are is that the services that were supposed to happen tomorrow at Indian Creek Presbyterian Church, unfortunately due to the weather, need to be postponed until Saturday. So visitation for Millie at Indian Creek will be from 12 to 2 on Saturday with service and interment at 2 p.m. I also want to say that I am truly sad that I did not have the opportunity to get to know Millie the way that so many of you all have had the opportunity to know and love her. Based on everything that I've been told, I believe she and I would have really enjoyed each other. Millie was faithful, kind, loving, and you would never leave her house with an empty stomach. As we worship together and remember Millie today, I want us to be open to the Spirit of God among us as we laugh and cry and share together. And I want to share with you one more thing before we truly begin. Millie had written down some very clear instructions for things the way that she wanted them to be today. One of those things was some rules she left for us. So please remember as we continue, friends, there is to be no roughhousing. No laughing, joking, or politics. And so now that we've already broken the rules, let us worship God together in scripture and songs and memories. Explain 
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art <clears throat> then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great Thou art, how great Thou art. From the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jerry. Okay. Is this connected? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Um, Millie, you know, you kind of, Millie liked to set the stage for activities that were going to come up. And she liked to, she had a way of liking to have things her way, I believe. <laughs> and she was pretty good at getting it done that way, too. And I'm going to add a little bit more. She said there was not to be told any dirty jokes during her funeral. And she also said there can't be any ugly talk. So she's got it said. I, I'm, 
my guess is we better obey because I can see her saying that in a way that you would know. Well, I, I have I better do just that. <clears throat> well, uh, there is so much that could be said about Millie, and I'm sure all of you have many things that you could say and many good things, happy things. And I know that I do. And I guess for my own feelings, I'd probably rather just be hugging you and telling you I love you rather than being up here talking. But if I'm going to sort of go ahead, and if I get to lose my train of thought, anybody out there, just feel free to come up here and start talking or stand up and stop wherever you are. <clears throat> um... I was thinking a little bit about funerals and how difficult they are and how these times come to pass in each of our lives. And they are, I think, uh, they are the most difficult times that we live through and we face. Uh, saying goodbye to those we love the most is the hardest thing we ever have to do and <laughs> but it is a good thing to honor people and remember people and get our memories set in the ways that we want to remember those who have gone on before us and uh, a funeral tends to accent it in that way <clears throat> Um, it's also been said that funerals are more for the living and those who are left behind than they are for the one who has departed because we believe those who have departed have gone into eternal joy in celebration with the Lord and we are left here to struggle along in our lives uh, until it comes our time to depart. <clears throat> I, in thinking about Millie, my thoughts sort of drifted back to a long time ago when we were a little family up in uh, Longs Creek in Breathitt County, and uh, we lived in the little house up on the Miller Branch just above our Grandpa Charlie. <clears throat> and uh, Pauline and Ollie had already... <clears throat> been born and myself to our parents and then it came Millie's time and I believe that I can remember her birth I think I was about three years old and I can remember trying to tiptoe up beside the bed to look up to see her laying there and I have been told someone asked me if I had a name for her or what I would like to name her. And uh, I have been told that I said, well, let's call her Little Sweetheart. And I guess that was the way I felt then and to some sort of reflects how I've always felt about her. For I have loved Millie all her life and all of my life. And, <clears throat> and that is something that will never end. <clears throat> Um, we have been through, as you all know, a pretty difficult year in many, many ways. And one of the most difficult things, beginning last first of March, we all had to distance ourselves from others including our own family members. And that has made life difficult. And we've lost a whole lot by having to do that. And uh, <clears throat> we've lost time there that we could have spent more with Millie and done more things together than we have been able to do. But I think the love that lives and was still exists. 
but nonetheless, <clears throat> we had to cancel our Christmas party, you know, that uh, Millie uh, started years ago at her house. We started gathering there and have done it uh, each year since she invited everyone to her home. And uh, we had to cancel that this year, sadly. And, of course, we moved it from her house to Buckhorn Lodge. And the crowd got so big that we had to have more room. So, But I think we will uh, hopefully get that renewed and going again. And I think Millie would like for us to do that. <clears throat> I recall uh, school from the early days when we lived and attended the little one-room Deaton school that was located actually on the farm, on the edge of the farm on which we lived. And uh, <clears throat> for a while, Pauline, our older sister, was our teacher there. And Millie was a student there. And I want to say that Billy uh, did was extremely interested in school, and she was an outstanding student wherever she went. We attended there, and then breathed high, and we rode the bus for about an hour and a half every morning and evening to get there and back home. <clears throat> then about the uh, when Millie finished her sophomore year, our oldest sister, Pauline, up and married Buddy Cornett. And when she did that, they, they left home. Um, they moved to uh, Fairfield, Ohio. And Pauline had never been away from home very much. And Buddy had a job in a paper factory there. And Pauline was left at home at night. And she had, she was kind of scary, Pauline was easily scared. And she decided she had to have somebody with her to keep her company, to stay with her, to protect her, I guess. So she came and got Millie and took her on with her to Ohio. And uh, I guess Millie looked after her. But anyway, two of our family members had disappeared and that reduced our family size. They had left a kind of sadness behind when they left. But Millie stayed there and applied herself, finished high school in Fairfield. Then she enrolled at <clears throat> Miami University and made sure that uh, she stayed with it and graduated from uh, Miami. <clears throat> and um, later on, she got her master's degree here and, and educated herself very highly, as all of you know. Millie was a very smart person. She applied herself, and she was very capable, and she had a good and long professional career, as all of you know. <clears throat> but along the way there, she met this feller uh, named Edward Lee, and I had, uh, the first time I met Edward Lee was uh, uh, attending uh, Future Farmers of America camp that was conducted at uh, see west of Louisville. I can't think of the town exactly right now. But Hardensburg. And Ed showed up there and uh, I went there too and, and got acquainted with him at that time. <laughs> of course we found out we live pretty close together, only 15 minutes driving apart. So Ed and I sort of became friends. Then he found out I had this beautiful sister named Millie. And boy, did he ever get interested. And did he pursue it until they were married. And uh, everybody knows the rest of the story. Uh, Ed, too, became a great friend of mine. Possibly the closest and maybe best friend I ever had. <clears throat> In trying to, in thinking a little bit about relating 
Millie in her life to uh, Scripture, a couple of things came to my mind. One of the things I thought of was the um, story of Ruth, as you probably are familiar with, uh, and the great faithfulness which Ruth exemplified and declared for her mother-in-law. I think Naomi, am I right? There was a, that was Naomi was her mother-in-law. But hard times came into that family, and uh, <clears throat> Ruth's, Naomi's husband died, and Ruth's husband died, and they were in another land at that time. And they were going home, but Naomi said, you better stay here amongst your own people. Uh, but she declared she was going with her. And I have some of the words written down that she said uh, that uh, wherever you go, I want to go. Wherever you live, I want to live. I want your people to be my people. And where you die, I want to die. And so she went back to Israel with uh, Naomi. <clears throat> but it exemplifies faithfulness. And I think Millie had this characteristic. When she committed herself to something, she didn't quit. She didn't give up until she achieved that. <clears throat> um, also, the uh, song of Ruth came, uh, excuse me, song of Mary came to my mind. <clears throat> As you know, uh, Mary was visited by the Lord and told that she would have a son. And she was celebrating that greatly. And then she utters the words that are included in the song of Mary in the scriptures. One of the lines I remember is that my, is that my soul magnifies the Lord. And when you begin to think about that, that means the way that person's life was lived and conducted made God more real, exemplifies the characteristics of the Lord, makes them known to others, and greatly expands life. I think Mealy had a lot of those characteristics as well. Uh, Millie was kind uh, in her life. She was concerned about other people. And I think she spent about all her life serving others. Because she gave of herself and her resources freely. And she was always ready to help anyone around she knew who needed help. And especially the family members. Some came and lived with her off and on at times. If they needed a little money, they knew where they could get it to. <clears throat> um, there, I know there's a number of other speakers. I could sit up here and talk a, a long time, but I'm going to stop at that point and just say that, <clears throat> that I have loved Millie and I know you love her, and I, I think she had a great life. She was a great person, and uh, we, we can remember her in many, many good ways and positive ways, and we want to do that. She will not ever be forgotten. <clears throat> I'll just say that I love her and I love all of you. Um, I'm here speaking for Jerry uh, Buck Deaton. That's Millie's nephew. And probably the nephew who tried her patience the most. So it's going to be kind of interesting because she had all these rules 
about appropriateness, and we all know Buck, but she did ask him to speak. He couldn't be here today, so I'm going to read what he wrote. <clears throat> it says, I'm sorry that I cannot be here today for my Aunt Millie. As things would have it, I'm making my way to Seattle, Washington, to see Emmy Deaton. I'm certain, though, that all is going well, and there is no horseplay or other forms of mayhem that may have taken place per my aunt's wishes. That being said, my Aunt Millie was a special gal. My first memory, and somehow my most enduring of her, and all my Deaton aunts and uncles, goes back to when I was about five years old. I was sitting on the porch of Mamaw Sophie's house at Miller Branch. What I can remember is that I was tired, and it was that magical time called dusk when darkness hasn't quite set in, but it's not really daylight anymore. All of Mamaw's children and their spouses were out there in the front yard running around after lightning bugs and playing a game of softball, and the air was full of laughter and playful words. And Millie and Ed were right in the middle of it all, having as much or more fun than all the children. Yes, Millie liked order, and it was a major part of her everyday life. She liked for things to go as they should, and when they did not, she was not shy about speaking up to make sure people readjusted. And if all of us had listened to her every time she made a suggestion, we would all be in a much better shape. And yes, I was on the receiving end of much of that advice because there were times that I tried her patience as much as any son had ever tried their own mother. There was that time when Wade and I played gourd ball in Mamaw Sophie's basement. And if you've ever thrown a gourd, you know that it will bust into thousands of pieces. Well, we were about 10 years old, and Millie spanked both of us for doing that. It really didn't hurt much, but I don't think she meant for it to either. And one time, I rearranged the Christmas lights on her front bu bushes to say what I wanted them to say. And But Josh Cardwell ended up getting the blame for that, still to this day. Um, and there was another time, it was very hard for John and I to explain why we had Stevie hogtied up on the pool table. And last but not least, she was not happy the time I suggested we just all put our hands behind our backs and eat at the dinner table like the hogs we were. Millie liked order, but more than anything, she loved having a house she kept. I'm sorry. She loved having her family and her friends around her house and in her house. And what a house she kept. She loved her place on Bridgeport Road dearly. She kept it spotless and decorated with fine antiques, and she wasn't happy unless it was full of people. And, and very often it was. It was no problem for her if every last one of us in the family piled in on her for a holiday event. She would cook the biggest meal you ever saw, and there would be dishes of food on every table and countertop, and people would be crammed in formal dining room and in the living room and sitting on stairs and stationed around the pool table, and every single person in the room would be talking all at the same time. I wish I had taken the time to look at her during one of those events and notice the satisfaction on her face that was no doubt disguised by her bustling around and giving orders to all of us. Without a doubt, Millie and Ed loved tending to people and feeding them better than any other two people I've ever known. And a good number of us lived with them when we were trying to get our start. I did, Wade, Leah, Charles, Ken, Devin, and probably many others that I've forgotten. I remember after my six-month visit had ended, I was packing my clothes in my car, and as I drove away, they were both standing there in the driveway waving me goodbye, and I was only moving across town. Millie and Ed were not only like second mothers and fathers to uh, Leslie and me, 
but for a good number of years, they were probably our best friends. We spent countless evenings having dinner with them, playing spade and rook, walking on the farm at Pea Ridge, or working in the garden behind the house. Millie was my card partner, and Ed was Leslie's. And when it came to Rook, there was no sympathy or taking it easy on one another. One night, as Ed lay in the hospital recovering from a heart ailment, Millie and I just pummeled, he and Leslie, and I remember feeling sort of bad, but not bad enough to ever throw a game of Rook. And Millie, well, she would get really mad at Ed if he and Leslie were beating us. If Ed didn't bid as high as she thought he should have, she'd purse her lips, look up at him and say, Now, Edward, you just drug your ass. And he'd look back and tee-hee at her and say, Now, Millie, you know I wouldn't do that, tee-hee. Millie may have been stern at times, and she may have demanded excellence, but the main thing I always remember about her is her laughter. And she laughed a lot. I absolutely loved it when she'd start telling the story and get tickled halfway through it and start laughing so high, hard her eyes would water. And she did love to laugh and tell stories. Her favorite was about a time a bunch of people were at her dining room table studying for a test to become A.L. Williams representatives. It was really quiet, and all of a sudden somebody tooted. And apparently no one was willing to own up to it or even recognize it until Ann Ollie just busted out laughing. And another person at the table tried to act like he didn't know what had happened, but the cat was out of the bag. Millie could never get through that story without crying tears of laughter. Millie was just a fine person in every way you can be fine. She loved unconditionally. She was generous. She was a person of faith, and she loved us all so very much. She has left an indelible mark on all of us, and no family gathering will ever be the same without her. And I just wanted to say that we were very close uh, when we first got married. We would go over their house all the time. We'd get into gardening and canning and breaking beans and... That's when uh, I guess it got cold, and we couldn't do that, so we started playing cards. And uh, we just uh, we were just very, very close to them. And uh, I can just what gives me satisfaction today is to knowing that Millie and Edward are up there together, probably playing Rook by now. And I'm sure Unc, as we speak, has just overbid his hand, and Millie is griping at him because he just drug his ass. And the thing that's so funny about that is I never heard Millie ever curse, only when she would say that to Ed. And she would get so mad at him that she would tell him she was, he was dragging his ass. But they were two so very special people to me. And uh, they'll be highly missed um, on Pea Ridge Road. Everybody said mom did have her order about things. She was a planner, and she made all of this so easy for us. We really had very little decisions to have to make, and she even had lined out every song she wanted sung and when she wanted sung and how she wanted sung. So that's just the way mom was. And I'm sorry you all have to put up with those, as my dad used to call it, the old pump word again, running out of air. But this is for mom today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind. 
that Marie, True, and myself would say a few words. We worked with your Kentucky Teachers Retirement System. So what a pleasure this is to be able to do this. From our friend Marie, I want you to know I love you, your quiet nature, your kindness, your friendship. I'm so glad we remained friends for so many years. We had many laughs and good times. I'm saddened that you had to leave us, but now I see you in constant sunshine, walking and dancing with Ed. Your presence will be greatly missed. Your forever friend, Marie. P.S. You could always clog better than I could. And I'm Donna Bell. We worked in the same office almost. I had the pleasure of working with Dear Millie at Teacher's Retirement System. What a smart lady and such a hard worker. So many teachers would ask for Millie, and she helped everyone that she could. She took time for all questions asked of her because she had all the answers. She excelled in a difficult situation. After we retired, we would all go out for lunch and celebrate birthdays. We laughed all the time and cried, too. We have a very special bond. I'd already made out a, a birthday card for Millie this coming Saturday. Now there's two of us left of the three, and we shall always remember what she meant to us. Thank you, family, for allowing us to do this and for telling her goodbye last Sunday. God bless each of you, and know that we were so blessed to call her our dear friend. Thank you. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. 
The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. you by. Weep not for the memories. We need to take these words to heart. What should we do with their time here on earth? There's always one more meeting for work, one more dirty dish in the sink, one more fallen leaf in the yard, one more disorganized drawer. But is that what that life is all about? Look at the people around you. Say, I will remember you, will you remember me? Then stop and think, how do you want to be remembered? Now is the moment. Start doing what you know is important. Read another book to your child. Do another random act of kindness. Sit around another campfire with friends and have another dinner with dad and mom. There's always time for what's important, only there isn't always. We see that today as we say goodbye to Millie. She won't be at dinner anymore. Her chair is empty. The time is now to make memories. Don't let your life pass you by. Weep not for the memories. Thankfully, Millie doesn't have to weep. She spent her entire life making memories. Each of us have a a Millie story. Most of us had many Millie stories. Millie liked a good joke. 
After all, she had years of Edward. One day, Joe Saharl and I snuck up to Millie's house, and we left a certain melon with a note on her front porch. The note says, what kind of melon has to have a church wedding? A cantaloupe. I asked her later, what did you do with the cantaloupe? She said, I cut it and I ate it. I said, you ate a cantaloupe from someone you didn't know that you found on your front porch? She said, well, I knew it was from you or Bucky won. <laughs> Josa and I had moved up in the world. We had been put in the same jokester class as Bucky. Millie knew what was important, her family and friends and her little dog, Charlie. There was no mistaking the love Millie had for her children and grandchildren. You could hear it in her voice. Call Stevie, he can fix anything. John is such a good cook, he makes a great salmon coated in nuts. Melanie can go with me, she knows how to get things done. Millie was always ready to go, whether it was to her beloved Eastern Kentucky mountains, up home as she called it, or on a cruise to Mexico, or simply running the road, stopping to check out anything that looked interesting. My dad said, Millie kept her suitcase packed. Millie was a good cook. When you visited, you knew what was for dinner. She was famous for her comfort food, fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. I don't like mashed potatoes and green beans. And she said I was hard to cook for. I never could convince her that if she'd just make me a bologna sandwich, she could save herself a lot of time and effort. But one thing we could agree on was chess pie. Hers was the best. We had a standard beginning to our phone conversations. She'd answer. I'd say, Millie Minner, what's going on? I always called her by her full name. She'd say, not much, Kimbo. I'd say, you got my chess pie ready? She'd say, no, haven't started it. You could count on Millie when you needed to talk. I'm sure most of you, anybody that knows Millie, knows that when she would purse her lips together and do other facial expressions that you better look out. And I want to read out of our Deaton book. It's a story about Millie. It's called God Expression. There comes a time in every family's life when the strangeness or quirks of its members pervades into society so much that it goes down in history to be long remembered and imitated by all. Hence, in the Deaton family, one such quirk has risen to the top of the other quirks so that it can be spoke of in one simple phrase and understood by all. Ours has become the Millie expression. It is the frequent and colloquial expression of mother, grandmother, sister, aunt, and cousin Millie Minner. A full Millie can be a frightening thing, but a partial Millie can be used simply to request milk, as, a, as the waitress at the Lady Luck Casino in Mississippi was a party to. Let me begin with the description of the full Millie, and then I will relate a story about how it was used. The single feature of every Millie, be it the full or to some degree, is the mouth clasped together in a thin, tight line with the lights, lips moved slightly upward and inward. This is the true Millie expression in every sense of the word. Then, if the expression is going to become a full Millie, the neck must be jutted out, the body slightly bent with the arms to both sides, reminiscent of a gunslinger ready to draw. When the body is in position and the lips are fixed just so, the only thing left is to shoot fire from the eyes. The eyes become a dark, brilliant cobalt blue. They eye the person who is receiving the expression and tiny darts of lightning seem to emit from them. When you have seen this, you have seen the full Millie. 
You may be wondering what could evoke such a display of personality. We could ask Edward and Stephen, as they have been a victim when I was, pre when I was present. Millie was in the basement of Mamma Sophie's ironing a bedspread. Edward and Stephen were impatient to leave for Indian Creek, but Millie knew what all needed to be done before they could leave. Edward and Stephen were ever persistent in their insistence that something would be lost if they didn't arrive on Indian Creek at exactly that moment. Finally, Millie had had enough. She put on the full Millie and turned menacingly toward Edward and Stephen. She seethed, go then. She raised the iron and pointed her hot weapon. Edward and Stephen, both frightened and relieved by the experience, took a quick exit to the car and drove off. I stood there holding the bedspread for Millie, not sure if I could spe should speak. Finally, the room returned to normal. This was the full Millie, but there are variations that mean different things. I will now describe the one seen most often, the quarter milli. This one involves only the mouth. The lips are pressed together straight across with only a straight line of the mouth. The quarter milli is used to accentuate a thought that must be spoken but doesn't want to be. When would this happen, you ask? When you request a glass of milk at a casino. When asked what she wanted to drink, Millie looked at the waitress, made the expression, and asked, do you have milk? The waiter, who didn't seem to care or was not surprised, made no reaction except to say yes and went on to the next person. Sometimes Millie made it more comfortable for everyone else to actually have the courage to order milk. The half Millie adds the neck jutting. It used if she scolds someone for a minor offense such as not doing the dishes, or when she has to tell somebody to do something over and over, or when someone has gotten onto her nerves till she's at the point of screaming. The three-fourths milli is more intense than the half milli. It is used when she really has strong feelings about something. Once when discussing the post office and their civil service exam, that in her words, no one could pass, the, the three-fourth Millie was seen. Millie declares this expression was born of early childhood experiences. According to her, she was the good child who did not get in trouble and could never tell a lie. When one of her less well-behaved siblings committed some act of indiscretion, Mommy could not find out who it was. She would ask, Millie, who did this terrible thing? Not being able to lie and not wanting to tattle, Millie would press her lips tightly together and refuse to tell what she knew. So next time you're angry and you're pushed to the brink, take a minute to think, which Millie are you making? Millie is not really gone. Um, our memories are going to sustain us and the stories that we have about her will bring her to life for the people who never have the privilege to know her. You'll see her in her grandchildren's smiles and in the flowers around her house and hear her when you least expect it. She will live on. As Mary Elizabeth Fry said, do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. For most of us, alma mater refers to the college we graduated from, or in some cases, our high school that we've attended. But alma mater translates into kind and nourishing mother. Kind of a strange phrase to apply to an institution, but in many ways it fits. It's what a school does. 
It educates us, nourishes our minds, and raises us to become fruitful members of society. However, when I think of the phrase alma mater, I can't help but think of Millie. Millie was always kind. Never was there a stray cat that came around that she didn't feed. At one point, we had more than 30 cats in the backyard. Come dinner time, they would all gather at the back porch, waiting for the scraps of food that she had gathered from various meals throughout the day. They were some very well-fed cats. But she was not just kind to animals. She was kind to people. One time she was traveling, I think for work, though to be honest, the details are a bit fuzzy now. She had checked into a hotel, but it was snowing. A young woman with a baby in the car was stranded, trying to get home, as her mil husband, who was military, was just coming home from deployment. The young woman had no money. She was a young military wife. But she could no longer safely travel in the snow. Millie paid for her hotel room and gave her money for food that night. She asked the young lady to call her, gave her her phone number, but the phone call never came, and Millie wondered for decades whether that young woman made it safely home. Millie was not only kind, as we've heard so much today, she was nourishing. No one ever left her home hungry. It was something of a family joke. She could not go to the grocery store without spending at least $300. She would look for things on sale, then stock up. Sometimes this meant her two freezers and three refrigerators were filled to the broom, brim, sorry, not to mention the pantry items that filled in the storage room. But the whole family would go shopping at Granny's store. And family wasn't just her biological family. It was in-laws, friends of kids, outlaws, anyone who had a need. When it came to meals, never did Millie fix enough for just the family. There was always plenty of food, no matter who showed up. If some extra people showed up, there was always something that could be thrown in the oven or heated up on the stove to feed extras. And if no one extra showed up, there was food to send home with those who were there or for leftovers for other meals. She even stretched to nourishing her neighbors. Many a time when we'd have something particularly good for dinner or if it was a holiday, Millie would fix up a plate to send down to Faye Utterback, who at the time couldn't get out and about much. If we were down visiting from Maryland, John would be sent to the house to give Faye her food, and I knew I wouldn't be seeing him for quite a while as he visited with Miss Faye. It was good for both of them, and Millie knew that. And speaking of us visiting, never did we come down without Millie asking us what meal we would like. Well, as Kim just mentioned, she was known for her fried chicken. That's usually what we'd request. Imagine our disappointment the year she gave us Kentucky Fried Chicken. Normally, when we'd go back home, she'd send us with a car full of food and some treats to share with my parents that she had baked. Millie was a mother of sorts to many other than her own biological children. Over the years, many of Melanie's, John's, and Stephen's friends considered Millie a second mom. And the neighbor house was the neighborhood gathering spot. Kids were in and, the house, in and out of the house all the time, and Millie liked it that way. Several of Millie's nieces and nephews lived with her for a time over the years, Devin even had his height marked on the wall with the kids and grandkids, twice, once on each leg. Millie wasn't the most demonstrative of mothers. She wasn't prone to spontaneous physical displays of affection. When John and I were visiting and Ed happened to call my parents to say hi in the middle of what we thought was my dad having a stroke, Millie was there for me. I remember standing in that parking lot of a restaurant in a blind panic not knowing what was happening to my dad, and Millie patting me in comfort and sympathy. That was about as demonstrative as she got spontaneously, but it showed her love very clearly. Of course, nourishing everyone was a display of love as well, but in addition to feeding everyone, she was unfailingly generous. She would offer to pay for things you wanted, especially if she thought it could help you out a little. Just recently, I was buying some yarn to make a hat for John. Some of you have probably seen the picture of it. It's the hat with trees. The yarn company that I was getting the yarn from was having a sale, so it was a good time to get the yarn. I wanted some black yarn to make his trees, but they were out of black. It wouldn't be back in stock until after the sale was over. I needed to start the hat before then because it was part of a knit-along. Um, and so... 
I ended up settling on a dark gray. As soon as Millie heard this, she offered to buy the black yarn once it was back in stock. And I knew that that was Millie telling me that she loved me. Millie also loved her grandkids and loved to spoil them to death. When Rachel was young, Millie loved to take her to Gatlinburg and buy her pretty dresses and dolls. Rachel became very used to this and thought it was kind of the norm. Rachel met another young girl at the doll store, but her mother wouldn't buy her a doll. Rachel told her to just go ask her own granny to buy her one. These are just a few of the stories and memories I will think of down through the years when I think of Millie, an alma mater indeed. She was my mom. She gave me life. She carried me, fed me, clothed me. Millie Minter was many things. When I think of mom, I instantly think of Kentucky. Mom was about as Kentucky as a girl can get. She began her life in a small mountain community we all know and love as the Miller Branch. Poor as our family was, we were rich in love. It was a happy life, a life with three other sisters and a brother. Mamma Sophie and Papa Jerry raised their children believing in the value of hard work and working together to take care of those you love. Mom believed in that concept wholeheartedly. She spent her life working hard to take care of everyone she loved and cared about. When mom was 15, as Jerry alluded to, she left her small world of Breathy County and went to live with Pauline and Buddy in Hamilton, Ohio. Mom thought it would be a huge adventure and even though she was leaving the only home she had ever known. I often wondered how hard it must have been for her to leave this little world, to not see her family every day. I cannot fathom myself being a mother, how Mama ever managed to let her go, knowing that she wouldn't see her daughter every day, or to be able to hug her child when she wanted to. But I suppose in addition to Pauline's need for Mom in Hamilton, perhaps Mama and Papa saw an opportunity for Mom to spread her wings and experience a world that she could have never imagined within the confines of Breathitt County, Kentucky. At a Sunday youth meeting at church, Mom met the love of her life, my dad, Edward Lee Miller. Looking every bit of James Dean with his rolled sleeve t-shirts and his slick back hair, my dad was taken by her, by her lovely face and her twinkling blue eyes. And Mom was a real beauty. I don't know if she ever realized just how stunningly beautiful she was. I think Dad loved her from the moment he met her. She was all he ever wanted, and caring for Mom was his last thought in this life. Together they built a home for themselves and for us, my brothers and me. Anyone who knows Mom, no, she loved to garden. She absolutely had the green thumb. She could make anything grow. She loved the beauty of flowers and loved to grow a big garden. She had a multitude of beautiful flowers all about her home and made it her own small world that I love to call Millie's Garden. And heaven knows she could have fed half of Franklin County with the garden she grew each spring. And many times she did sending bushels and bushels of food to the local food kitchen. I remember one day I had picked green beans. Mom had grown six rows of green beans, and I picked for ten hours straight, and I only got over the first four rows. We broke between the total of picking beans and broke, breaking beans. We worked 18 hours that day, and Mom was canning as fast as we would break them. Over that, that four rows, we canned. 300 quarts of green beans. And when we were done with that, we just kept on picking. And I started carrying bushels full, two or three bushels full every day down to the local food kitchen. And she canned enough for all of her sisters and Jerry and the students had took them down to neighbors, anybody and everybody that needed food, she gave them, made sure they had food. Mom was a teacher and an educator. She believed in academic, academic excellence and she expected nothing less of us. She could be demanding and she could be intimidating as heck sometimes, but that was only because she and dad wanted what every parent dreams of, 
a better life for their children than they had themselves. She loved beautiful music, and I believe she would have loved to learn to play many instruments. She dreamed of writing music and did write some lyrics that I thought were really very good. But I don't know why she never pursued that dream for herself. I wish she had. She understood the benefits a child gains from the beauty of music and from the science behind music. I remember when I was in sixth grade, I wanted to join the band and play the clarinet. And you have to understand, to mom, learning to play an instrument was like gaining a life skill, like learning a trade. And she had played clarinet. And even though I wanted to play clarinet, she didn't like it, so she wouldn't let me. So she, she insisted I play trumpet, and I did for a bit. But I learned I didn't really care for the trumpet, and I, one next year, dropped out of band, and I joined the chorus. She didn't find out about it until my first six-week report card came in. And um, then I got what... Kimberly lovingly referred to as the Millie expression. She was, it was probably the closest I ever came to death as a child. She uh, did the Millie expression. She did jutting. I got the full Millie, the full jutting out the teeth, the big eyes, and the hands down like this. She said, singing, singing, that old, that old singing will never do you any good. At least with band, you were learning to play an instrument. <laughs> but she let me keep on singing because she soon figured out that I actually did have a little talent for singing. And she gave me that gift, even though she didn't even know it. She had a collection of albums like Andy Williams, The Lennon Sisters, and my favorite, Barbara Streisand. I would spend hours, and that's what I, where I learned to love to sing. She, uh, she was really something. And even though Mom was not big, as Susan said, on openly giving compliments and open displays of affection, she loved for me to sing, and although she would never really just ask me to come out and ask me to sing for her, she finally did towards the end, and I did. I sang a lot for her towards the end. I sang for you today, Mama, because you wanted me to and because I love you and for all the gifts that you gave me. Mom and Dad gave us a home like every child in this world deserves to have, a warm home, good food, and more toys than we deserved, and all the love in the world. When I was about five years old, Mom gave me a room for a princess. It was ballet pink, and she and Dad filled it with lovely colonial-style white and gold-gilded furniture. I still have that furniture, and I used it for my own little girl's princess room. I loved that room, and I think it was a room that Mom probably had dreamed of for herself. Well, maybe not all the Donny Osmond and Sean Cassidy posters, but it was something she liked. When Jonathan came along, he had an enormous thirst for knowledge and love for studying all things wildlife and anything dinosaur. She was in the midst of her master's degree. She had started working on it, and she was busy developing lesson plans and bulletin boards and learning centers for elementary school age children. And she had this one book about going on safari. And it was a little pop-up book. You know, you pull the little lever and the page pops up. And she read that book to us just virtually every day. And out of that book, she came up with the idea for Jonathan, and she painted his room opposite walls, bright green and yellow. And she found these adorable green, bright green jungle-themed curtains and bedspread that had lions and tigers and bears and giraffes and monkeys all peeping out from the jungle greenery. She filled his room with volumes of animal, the animal kingdom, life sciences, and, of course, dinosaurs. She created a magical world just for Jonathan. Any child would have loved it, but it was perfect for Jonathan. I loved that room myself, too, and that was just what Mom did for us. She tried to give us all the things she had dreamed would make of the world special and magical just for us. Mama sometimes wondered if she had done enough with her life and if she had done what God had intended for her to do. I wish she could have realized just how truly wonderful she was. Maybe she was never famous. Maybe she never traveled the world, but never doubt that Millie Minner was absolutely exactly what God intended for any of us. She was a fisher of men. She spread God's love through her love of us, through her faith, through her love of her family, through her boundless, generous heart that would give everything she had to help a neighbor in need. 
She spread God's love through her compassion, through feeding every person who passed through her door, and through her education, giving opportunities and hope to countless children. In finishing today, I'm going to read a story that Mom wrote about her life, and then I'm going to read a poem that she wrote. She was an incredible, special, gifted lady. She was my mom, and I'm going to miss her every day of my life. I thank God that he chose Millie Miller to be my mom. And I thank God for you, Mom. The fifth fifth child. The fifth child of a family of six arrived at the Breathitt County home of Sophia and Jerry Deaton on March 6, 1941. This child was born at home with the aid of a local doctor. Hospitals were far away with only a dirt road and horses and wagons for travel. A cool oil lamp and fire in the fireplace provided light and warmth on that cold March morning. I'm sure the small white house was quieter than usual, for it was the baby, for it was the custom for older children to spend the night with grandma and grandpa when a new baby was expected. The child who weighed perhaps a little over five pounds arrived with little fanfare or much ado. However, there was much commotion with the arrival of the older children. After the initial excitement had subsided, the name Millie, which was the paternal grandmother's name, was selected for this fifth child. Soon to the little country school just down the road and life resumed as normal. War talk, planting for spring, and the weather dominated most conversation, I'm sure. Many moons were spent living the simple life. Many hours of family work were done. Many, many stories were told by our father as we gathered around the fire or sat by the, on the big front porch of our home. However, civilization was soon to arrive in the mountains of southeastern Kentucky to alter this simple lifestyle. In the summer of 1950, a gravel road was constructed, and our father purchased a beautiful, shiny red international pickup truck. This was a terribly exciting summer. What a thrill to go zooming down the road in that shiny red truck. What a thrill for this fifth child to see the county seat of Breathitt County for the first time. Jackson just had to be one of the largest towns in the world. Further civilization arrived in 1954 with the coming of the electrical power company. Wires attached to our house brought the brightest lights we'd ever seen. The refrigerator instead of the well kept our milk and butter cold and provided ice in neat cubes instead of long icicle shapes that hung from the roof and the cliffs in the winter. The water was so cold in the summer that it ached our teeth and froze our mouths. Life continued to change for our little mountain family. The children no longer had to stay at the boarding school of Buckhorn, but were able to ride the big yellow school bus to the high school. We boarded the bus at 6.30 a.m. and returned home about 5.30 p.m. No complaints of dusty roads or long jolting bus rides were ever allowed because the older children had had it that much harder. By this time, This fifth child was now 16 and had completed the sophomore year of high school, Algebra II, English, English, Latin, etc. Then came the biggest change of my life. My oldest sister, who is now married and lived in Hamilton, Ohio, wanted this 16-year-old child to to come home and live with her. After much pleading with our parents, this arrangement was agreed upon. Going to live in the big city had to be just about the most exciting thing that could ever happen to a 16-year-old girl. What an awakening, and what a different world. I had never visited my sister before. Packing and leaving home was an emotional time, especially for my parents, but the excitement for me won out. However, this excitement was soon to end. Arriving in Hamilton was literally a shock. Streets going everywhere, terrible traffic, huge buildings, people in a hurry, and a terrible smell in the air that, that uh, hurt my nose. Little did people in a hurry, and anyone care, that a little country girl from the mountains of Kentucky had arrived. In fact, the arrival of more dumb Kentuckians was looked upon with much disfavor by native Ohioans. Little did they care that this child was scared to death and extremely lonely and homesick. The students had little sympathy for a dumb Kentucky girl who didn't 
know her way around the big senior high school of 1,900 students. The going was really rough, but this Kentuckian was not accustomed to being a second-rate citizen. While our family had not been accustomed to having much in the way of material things, a sense of pride and determination had been instilled within us, traits this child had not even recognized until now. Even though I longed to go home to my parents and to breath at high school, I was not about to admit defeat and leave. I'll never forget the surprised looks on some of the students' faces when I would make a hundred on a test or forget the statements from teachers. She really knows her English good, and she's from Kentucky. Somehow I managed to survive and graduate with honors. I even received the award for the most outstanding business student in my class on graduation night. Even though I had made many friends and made a certain degree of adjustment to city life, I still longed to return to Kentucky. It was not to occur, though, until I graduated from Miami University, Oxford, Ohio, with a degree in business education in 1963. I returned to southeastern Kentucky, married my childhood sweetheart, and accepted a teaching position at Buckhorn High School in Perry County. I taught there three years until my husband, who had previously worked in Frankfurt between years of college, decided he would like to live in Frankfurt. Together we decided to make Frankfurt our home. We came here in 1966 and have lived here ever since that time. I have taught seven and a half years at Franklin County and Frankfurt High Schools. My husband, who taught chemistry and science for four years, has worked for the past 13 years as a chemist in the Department of Transportation with the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We have three children, ages 16, 11, and four. I have not taught since the arrival of our third child. However, during the last two years, I attended Georgetown College and received my MA degree in May of 1980. I'm currently working on my certifications and guidance. While I am still unemployed, I do hope to return to teaching next year when my youngest child begins school. The years have been good to me, and I'm grateful. My life has been altered, and I hope that in some small way, I might be able to instill in my students a sense of personal pride and self-worth and a determination to succeed no matter how simple or complex that task might be. And this is a poem that she wrote up at Longs Creek while our own grandmother was nearing her the end of her life. It's called Love and Let Go. I've said a prayer. I've asked him, please, to show us the way. Please tell us today. Our dear mother's hands are tired and very weak. Please lend an ear and let us hear you speak. Speak, Lord, loud and clear so that we will know which way it is that you want us to go. Your mother is tired. She's run a good race. Surely you must know she can't keep the pace. She's worn and weary. She's ready to rest. I welcome her now upon my heavenly breast. I know you love her, you don't want to know, but the time has come to love and let go. The gates of heaven are open very wide. My hands are outreached to lead her inside. The streets of heaven are truly pure gold. The meadows are green and the streams run cold. Her friends are waiting, her loved ones are too, to welcome her home, never more to roam. The feast is ready, the table is set. Oh, what elation, this celebration. All heaven will sing, the joy bells will ring. Time will have no end, God's love will transcend. In only a while, you'll see her again. So love her once more and open the door. The angels will come to carry her away. They'll bring her gently where she is to stay. She will stay with me in this lovely place. She'll wear a white robe that's made of white lace. Thank you, Mama, for all the gifts. Thank you, God, for the life of Millie.
From the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he said to me, These people have come out of the great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason that they are before God's throne. They worship God day and night in God's temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. The lamb will lead them to springs of life-giving water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you again for the life the love, the faith of your servant, Millie Minter. We thank you for the blessings that she has given to her friends and her family, for the love that was shared, for the food that she made, for the nourishment that she gave in great ways and in small. We thank you for her life and her witness. And we pray that we could look at the life that she lived and use it as not only an example of the way that you have called us to live in Christ, but as a challenge to live out the life that you call us all to. God, we grant Millie's body to this earth knowing that her soul is with you and that her soul is at rest. Gracious God, be with us who mourn. Give us laughter and tears. Give us stories. Give us peace when we need it. God, thank you for this time that we have had to come and worship and share. And God, we lift up to you all of these prayers, praying them in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on his gentle breast, there by his love, all oh, shaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. is a voice of angels born in a song to me over the fields of glory over the 
the benediction um, as we said Millie liked things done a certain way and one of the things that Millie did was she actually wrote a letter to her sisters and brothers and I was asked to read it she writes to my loving sisters and brother my life has truly changed since I've developed these health problems. It's my opinion that God has determined my time to be short. I can't survive the ordeal I have each day for much longer. God always knows best. He gives me strength to make it each day, but my strength is waning. I'm tired and ready to do his calling. All of you have truly been wonderful. You've helped me in so many ways. Your love and concern has been so appreciated. I just want to tell you how much I love each of you. I couldn't ask for a better family. There are many things I've wanted to accomplish, but haven't. I haven't done much with my life. I could have done much more. As one of the people in our Sunday school class said, I can only hope I've done enough or been good enough to get into heaven. I pray that each of you will have many more years and a wonderful life. I've had a good life and I thank God for his love and mercy. Sometimes I feel the end of life would be a blessing it will be exciting and wonderful to enter God's kingdom and finally know what heaven is like. I plan to be there with God the Father, and I'll be waiting for all of you. Also, it will be wonderful to see Edward, Mom and Dad, and all our family and friends. Again, I love you all.
Friends, Millie lived an amazing life. She has accomplished more than she will ever realize. And we are all better for having known her. Once again, please remember that the services at Indian Creek have been moved to Saturday, March 6th. More information will be available at different times. And family and friends, I offer now this blessing to close our time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make the divine face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.